you have a seat this morning. Now, uh, the other uh, the other day, uh, as we begin to see a lot of what's unraveling in our country in a way uh, that for some of us, of course, with the virus is new for a lot of us. Um, but now what we're seeing unravel in a way is, is not new for, for many of us. And how we respond to it and how we talk about it and the way that we look at it as the church is not always so easy. It's not always so cut and dry because of maybe our backgrounds, um, maybe how uh, we've experienced life growing up in our families, um, in our schools, in our family reunions at times, uh, maybe just at work in some of the conversations. Uh, today, um, and this was probably about three or four days ago, I said, I don't wanna just roll into our next series. Um, I, think we need to, I think we need to pause for just a moment. Um, I think we need to, to talk a little bit and share a little bit of what our faith looks like when we're seeing all of this happen in our country. Um, of course, I have a background with that, um, and I'll share a little bit of that, but I brought up, of course, Joel uh, is our worship pastor right here. Um, he has a background with what this looks like in our country. Of course, Mark here is one of our lead team pastors. Um, he's right here, Mark Simpson, and he has a background with that. And then Lewis Austin is one of our elders who grew up uh, in the country. And I said, we need Lou up there. We definitely do, because he's got an incredible perspective that I can't wait for you to hear. And so just rest back, just chill for just a little bit. If you're watching online, you're thinking, this is kind of different. Yeah, it's different, it's different for everybody. And so we're just gonna talk just a little bit. Um, if you have a, a question, if you have a question, if you have something that's on your heart, something that, would, uh, that really you need peace about, um, we want you to share those, okay? We don't want you popping up where you are and just yelling, okay? Um, that would be fun and weird, but we want you to text those in, all right? We have somebody who's actually checking out and looking at the questions, and right towards the end of all of this, at the last uh, five or six uh, minutes or so, we're going to take some of those questions. Um, listen, we're, we're, we may not know the answer. Just like your doctor, your doctor says, hey, you know what, I'll call you in a couple days, because we may not have the answer. We may not, maybe the answer is for some of us just that we don't know. We, we want to pray and give that over to God, but, but maybe we do. Maybe we have something that we know in Scripture that we can speak to, okay? So this is Mark Simpson right here. This is Lewis Austin, one of our elders, and of course, you know Joel Walewa. I'm Kenny Davis, lead pastor here at this amazing church that I would go to even if I wasn't the pastor. There you go. So the other day, um, like I said, I... I wasn't, I just, and this is maybe weird for some of you, but I was in the shower and I just started crying. And my wife's over there, she's like fixing her hair or whatever, and she kind of looks over at me and she could tell that something's up. And my heart just was breaking. My heart was breaking for what's happening right now. And I know that for me, that wasn't just my, my flesh, my heart. I think it's was the Holy Spirit that within me was breaking for what's happening culturally. Of course, what's happening with um, this senseless killing that we saw, that many of us saw, and my, just my heart was breaking. And I said, man, we have to talk about this as a church. We have to share this and talk about what our place is as the church. Um, we know I want to begin with a verse that kind of will set the foundation today for us. And it comes out of Galatians, Galatians 3, 28. And this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church, that a church that was struggling, of course, was seeing division. And the division, of course, was between the Jews and the Gentiles, between what we thought was slave and what we thought was free, what we thought was male and what we thought was female. And the Apostle Paul through the inspiration of Jesus Christ, gave us this verse that sets the foundation for everything we're seeing today. He says here, he says, there is neither Jew, there is neither Gentile, there is neither slave, there is neither free, nor free, he says, nor is there male and female. He says, for you are all 
You are all one in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And when we read that and we see what we're seeing across our landscape, we have to ask ourselves what that really means to us. I know, Mark, that uh, we were talking about this yesterday a little bit and kind of what we're seeing across our, our, our culture and how this applies. Can you go ahead and share a little bit? I mean, it applies because the world is looking uh, at not only how people are reacting and there, there's a super awareness right now, but the world is also looking at the church and at what is our response to all of this? What should we be doing about all of this here? And, um, you know, I think... To start off, I think what we're going to do is try to tell you a little bit of background about who we are up here. Um, my name is Mark Simpson, if you didn't know. I'm the youth pastor here at South Community, and I am half Korean and half Caucasian. My mom met my dad when he was in the military. He's been in the Army for 20 years, and they fell in love without even being able to talk to each other, you know? So I guess, you know, they liked how each other looked. I don't know. <laughs> so... Time passes, and now they have three kids, and there's this world that we're growing up in that's very multicultural. Um, being in the military, you get to mix with a lot of people that don't look like you. I grew up on a street uh, in Arkansas called, called Don Street, and on that street, there were some other Simpsons there, and they were a really nice black family, and we were the Simpsons that were the Korean family, you know? <laughs> And I was like, that was my worldview. I was like, oh, cool, you guys have my last name, last name. And we played together, and we, we had picnics together, and it was just a great time. But as you grow up, unfortunately, you have interactions that change not your worldview, but what you see in other people and their worldview and what their preconceived notions are and what their uh, prejudices are. And it wakes you up. Um, one thing that I know is that growing up, uh, being Korean, and we, when we moved to Tulsa, we went to a Korean church. I love this church, but also I knew that it was really unique that sometimes the prejudices came from your own people, that being mixed, sometimes you weren't Korean enough, right? You know, your eyes were too round, or you're, you didn't know enough Korean, or, you know, I didn't like all the kimchi they made. I don't know. But there was a point where you start to be very aware, like, I'm a minority of a minority. And, and you have to look at a place where you get guidance. And for me, it was the Bible. Because I see Christ and how he interacted with people. He never disregarded someone because of how they looked or a sickness or the region that they lived in. So that's a little bit about me. Lou, what about you, brother? Uh, for me, it was nothing. Like what you experienced, obviously. You were Korean enough? <laughs> yes, I wasn't my Korean brother. enough. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, my journey started in the 80s, of course. Uh, I'll be 40 this year, so that kind of dates me. But, um, but I grew up in basically the armpit of Rogers County. And I don't say it as, uh, you know, it's just the way the county is shaped. We're out there in the grip. <laughs> we're at the armpit. So I grew up in Chelsea. And, uh, but my dad, my, their family, they all originated from Alloway. If you've ever been through Alloy, you're one of the very few that's been through Alloy. It's kind of northeast of Chelsea, but but that's where I grew up at. And in Chelsea, we were a strictly white community. I mean, nothing but Caucasians as far as the eye can see. And uh, growing up there, I, it it was it was really out of the norm. I mean, you, you, when when you're young, you don't want to. You, know, you remember the stupid stuff. Let's just put it like that. But growing up through school, you know, with just, you know, all my white buddies. And uh, my freshman year, we had our, our first uh, mixed kid come into, into, into the school. And, uh, yeah, can you, what, what? But uh, this shouldn't be a big deal. And to me, it wasn't a big deal. He was just another kid. But to a lot of my friends and uh, kids that were older than me that I looked up to, they hated him because of the color of his skin. And I had never experienced or... I couldn't tell you if, if I'd ever even heard the word racism up until that point in my life because it's just something we never dealt with. And uh, I'll never forget that, that one experience, because it, it made me reflect on, on the way I, way I was raised. You know, my dad grew up in Alloway, which isn't far from, from Noah, and uh, he had what he called a lot of families. Last night was kind of interesting. I got to sit down and actually have dinner with him and talk about it. And... Uh, 
and ask him a little bit, told him what we were going to be talking about today at church, and, and we were just going to discuss, you know, the times, and, and he was just saying, he said, Louis, you know, there were several families there. He doesn't describe them as black or, or a colored family. It was just, there, we had several families there in Alley. and if you've ever been through Alley, like I said, it's, you know, there's maybe 30 houses in there, so several families was a big part of that population, and he was just saying as growing up, he said, from when we were little kids all the way into my 20s, we, they were just people. And it originated with my grandmother because of her Christian values and the, what she believed. And I remember this from when I was very, very young. You know, during the summer months, my dad was a coal miner, so we didn't have a lot of money. And my grandmother would watch us every year. And every time we'd go over to grandma's, we would have a Bible study every single time. And I remember her saying and pointing at to me, Louis, and saying, Louis, David, you're no different than the person down the street. The person down the street is no different than you. So don't you ever look down your nose at somebody else? I was like, okay, yes, Grandma. Yes, Grandma. But I didn't really know what she meant at that time because it was, it was foreign to me. But I, looking back, those Christian values and, and those things that, that were instilled in her whenever she was a little girl that she instilled with my dad, and we didn't go to church like we were supposed to when we were younger. But those same values were translated into my life. And to, to see what, what these guys have experienced and, and uh, the lenders in our family some, or in our community group, what they've shared, it's all foreign to me. So to me, it, it's kind of, it's, it's strange because now I have to teach my children about what, what other people are going through. And I feel like this is such a poignant time in our, in our history because now it can grow exponentially. And what I mean by that is me teaching my boys. I've got two over there. If they each have two children, that's, you, you see what I'm saying, where I'm going. That, I, I don't know, I, I just think it's an interesting time that we live in, that we can literally change history. We can change the future of this world, but it all depends on what we decide to do right now. Before we go <clears throat> to you, Joel, uh, one, one thing we do know is that it's not foreign, as we're seeing all this, it's not foreign to God. Like we've seen, uh, like what you're describing and how, well, we know what they look like and this is how we're gonna treat them is not foreign to God. The reason why we know this is because in John 4, listen to this, and some of us know the story of the Samaritan woman. It says clearly in John 4, 4, one of the things that are, are amazing that the Jews would go around Samaria. They did not wanna go through Samaria because Samaritans were half breeds. Samaritans were half breeds and we're thinking of racism this is where this, where we're looking at it, it's live right here in scripture in John 4. And Jesus, listen to this, speaking just like words from your grandfather, all right? He's like, I don't, we don't see that. And it says right here in John 4 that he had to go through Samaria. It says he had to. It says now he had to go through Samaria. And so he came into a town of Samaria, okay, called Sychar and near the plot of ground. And this was where the woman at the well was. And so he had to go through Samaria to, to show us as, as believers, as, as the church, what it means to connect with people who don't look like you. And the disciples were saying, why are you going through there? And, and you're, what you're describing from what your upbringing was from your grandmother, this is why. Because I want to I wanna show you that this is how we treat people that don't look like us. And what, what was the result of the story? Many people in Samaria came to know Christ that day. Many people. Some of us have had a background where it, it, it's been discriminatory. You know, we've, we've experienced some of these things where Lou is saying that he's seen it happen. And then some of us have also experienced that. I've asked Joel to, to be able to, you know, express some of that. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting, you know, growing up, um, because like, like Mark, you know, I've experienced um, things on both sides because I'm, I'm mixed as well. And um, same, you know, with my family, uh, my brother and sister who, who were up here earlier uh, leading worship. But, and I'm not going to go through all the stories. Uh, we'd be here all day. But um, just to highlight a couple of, of things that um, will ex help you have an understanding of, of what my perspective might be or, or our perspective might be. Um, I remember... Uh, in uh, in sixth grade, uh, my, my next door neighbor was in the KKK, okay, actively. 
Um, so we were not allowed to go outside um, and play, which was foreign to us because we always did that. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I had that experience, but that, then at school, you know, I went to a school that was primarily black kids. My best friend was white and we got in fights all the time. I got in fights because my, because the black kids did not like that I had a white friend. Uh, he got beat up because his white, the white kids didn't like that he had a black friend and that got so bad that his mom actually had to pull him out of the school um, and they moved away. So I had that experience. We moved back here. We went to Broken Arrow. Um, in high school, I had, you know, this kid that called me the N-word every day, every day in class. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I remember one day, there's kids in here, so I won't say what I did, but I took care of it one day. Um, and because he said something about my mom, he said, uh, I got mad at him, called me the N-word, I got upset. He said, uh, you're just mad because your mom couldn't keep a job as a slave. And uh, so... I, was, I reacted to that and, uh, and kind of put an end to it, but it was just that kind of stuff that, that would happen, um, just kind of constantly. It almost, it almost wasn't even like, um, it just kind of felt normal at, at, at a point. It just got like, you just kind of expect people to, to do stuff like that. Um, and, and I remember, you know, that was high school. I remember I've been pulled out of my car at gunpoint and accused of stealing the radio out of my own car by police. Um, and those are the kinds of experiences that, that lead us to feel the way we do when we see things like this. It's, it's, not, it's not the one incident that happened in the one video. It's like a lifetime of experiences that build up. It's all these things that when you see videos like what we saw this week, that all comes that all come like flooding back into your memory. Um, even just going to the store like this was just a few years ago, and, and me and my brother and my sister were in, we were in New Mexico. We were followed around the store by the store owner. She had a line of customers at the cash register ready to check out. She would not let us out of her sight. Um, and so now we could have got mad and filmed it and yelled at her and. and and made a big scene. We kind of made a game out of it, honestly. I mean, we, we walked around and I'd, I'd pick something up and she would come over to where I was and, and, I, and then my brother would, you know, he'd run over here and grab something and then she would try to follow him and I'd put it down and I'd go with this other. And so we did, and we did this for probably like an hour. I mean, she had the longest line of people trying to check out. But it's that, those are the kinds of experiences that, you know, we, we um, grew up with. And, and guys, I'm not, old, so this is not that long ago. Um, and the last one I'll say is, is, is um, I was sitting at another friend's house, and the year Obama got elected, so this was not that long ago, and uh, his parents were having a conversation with, with some friends of theirs or something, and I'm sit they must have forgot I was in the room, and, uh, and the, the friends were like, they were complaining about stuff, you know, how politics goes. And, uh, and one of them was like, well, that's just what happens when you let color into the White House. And I remember popping up, like popping up off the couch and I just turned around and kind of stared a hole through this lady. And they, it got awkward, they, they got up and left. It was, it was weird, but you know, those are just a few examples of some things that kind of set the tone. And, and I know there's a lot of people that when you see all the hurt and all the stuff happening, that, that it's those kinds of experiences, they all just bubble up, you know, and they kind of, <laughs> I think I've talked to the guys about it this last week about how, why are we surprised though? Like when we watch some of this stuff that we see and we see that it's evil outside of the, the, the love of Christ, if the person who's not under the love of Christ and we see this stuff, why are we surprised by that? Why are we, we look at it, is it because of humanity? When we say it and we're like, well, there's just humanity that, we, that, that should not happen. But, the only thing we see in scripture is that what pulls us all together is our connection with Christ. Other than that, what is the, what is the, 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 the upbringing? Like what, what is, what, where is the foundation of what we said? Scripture talks about foundation, that, that if you don't have the solid foundation of Christ, when things start to get like they are now, then things begin to crumble. And then we rest back on what we were raised with. And for some of us, that was uh, for, Man, for some of us, 
Let me tell you, Christy is the first woman, first girl, whose parents allowed me to date her. My mom's white, okay, my mom's white, so naturally, here's what happens if you don't know how it works, usually. If your mom is white, you begin to look for white girls. You don't just, you know, your dad's black, so you don't, you, you, you just begin, because you, if you love your mom, you're like, oh, I love my mom, like, you're naturally drawn to that. And so at, through school, where I, was growing, where I was growing up, I was naturally drawn to that. And listen, <coughs> I like the girls, man. I had a few girlfriends, all right? I'm kind of slick. I used to have hair, all right? It was sweet, curly, I'd activate it, all right? So- I did girl, not activate it. I, I activated it. I had the little spray blue oh, girls. Oh, okay. let's get some proof. I know, I know, oh, I know. Man. And then it all went away. Christy took me anyway. But um, Christy, like I said, I had three or four girlfriends just before Christy, that's it. But all of their parents didn't want me dating her. I couldn't go into their houses. One, one girl was like, um, you need to sneak in the back door just for us to watch a movie together. I may look old, I'm not that old. I'm 43, 44, I forget my age, so I'm kind of old. But like, I'm not that old, and some of you are older, and you've, you know your experiences, and you've seen that. But the one thing that kept my, my faith the one thing that kept my faith was that I knew God loved me first, and I knew he would take care of me, even though there was evil out there. And I wonder as the church, as we begin to, to talk and, and, and decide how we're going to believe when we see all of this, if we believe that way. If we say, you know, everything looks like it's burning, and for some places, literally, everything looks like it's burning down. But do I trust God? Do I trust my foundation I have with the Lord? So what we're seeing right now is we're seeing behavior where someone has prejudice, racism in the heart, and they literally, by their actions, they're pointing at someone and saying, I disapprove of you. I don't know you, don't know your name. I don't even know like your background, but they're saying by their actions, I disapprove of you. The gospel teaches us a total opposite of that. That we, as we... As, as we look at the timeline of history, all of us have a grandfather named Adam, okay? That is the bloodline of your flesh. But something supernatural happened with Jesus because we all now have a new bloodline through Jesus Christ. And he calls us all to be brothers and sisters. And he calls us approved and worthy to be a part of a family of God. So when he says that, yeah, there's, there's no Jew or Gentile, that's what he's saying. He's saying that all of you now are included into this family. And what I'm commanding you to do, not a suggestion, but I'm commanding you to go and love thy neighbor. A lot of what you're seeing today is people have failed that morality and they have let down that ability to love thy neighbor. To look at another human being as worthy of God's love and grace. To look at them as an object and say, I can persecute you because you don't look like me. That is not what the family of God is called to do. In Colossians 3, 10, it says this, put on your new nature. Now listen, some of you are not far removed from racism. You could have had a grandfather. You could have had a father. You could have had an uncle. You could have had your brother. Anyone pouring this into your life of saying, hey, you need to look at these people in a different way. But the Bible says this, put on a new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. The Bible calls us to be image bearers of Christ. And it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, that far removed or like through, through lineage that you've learned about prejudice or racism. The Bible says, no, 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 it changes. As soon as you call in the name of Jesus, we are called now to become and follow after Jesus Christ and become an image bearer of who he was. And just like Kenny read, when Jesus went to Samaria, he proved to his disciples, I'm way up beyond what you think is normal. What I think is normal is people that are worthy of my father's love. And that's it. Yeah. yeah looking at somebody different, too. I, it was a thing that always blew my mind because, you know, I grew up in church and I grew up, um, you know, reading scripture and even just had a fundamental understanding that we're all created in God's image made it really difficult to understand how you could treat somebody different for how they looked. Because it was like, okay, well, if I'm made in God's image 
and you're made in God's image, and I hate you, do I not hate the image of God then? Is that not what I'm saying? And, and it made no logical sense to me at all. You know, and it's those those kinds of things in scripture that you see. It's like, I mean, how can you how can you look at anybody other than God's image? You know, and, and that's another area that I think, you know, we forget about and struggle with sometimes. Yeah, I mean the, the thing too we have to, to understand is what is the enemy trying to do? Like some of us get we get kind of surprised. By, oh, there's something happening and we're surprised by it. We can't be surprised at what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to bring confusion and division. It's what he's doing. He's trying to bring confusion and division. And it can happen through something we see culturally on the news, something that we see through social media, something that can happen even in our own homes that brings division among, some of you deal with this in your own families, that you know something is happening maritally, something is happening with your with uh, maybe an extended family member, something's happening where it's bringing division because that's what the enemy wants to do. His name is Satan, and here's what he wants to do, create division. If he can create more division and more chaos, look what we're seeing, if he can create more chaos, then, then we guess what happens? God gets lost in the mix of all of it. And we don't know what to do. And we resort back to being angry, looking at people differently, and saying, I think I'll just stay with people that look like me. Regardless of if they're a child or a, a child of God, we talked about a few weeks ago. And we can't do that. We've got to be better than that as a church. I think we've said this before, but uh, we know that the most segregated day of the week is Sunday. That on a Sunday morning, you have places of worship that are predominantly segregated because you have the white church, you have the black church, you have the, hey, there's Korean churches out there. There's a lot of them. Y'all need to look into that. Um, there are all kinds of churches. If you are a certain race, you can go find insert race Baptist church. It's out there, okay? But is that truly... Is that truly what God has a picture when he thinks of his family? When I came to this church, I mean, we're going on nine years ago now. It's beautiful. I saw this beautiful image of what God has called the church to be. Diverse. Of not just race, but also age and demographic and socioeconomic and all of those things. And I feel blessed to call this my home church because South Community, we are a diverse church. I mean, we have, we have more families in this church with adoption stories than I can think of. That people will look and say, I love you, not because of how you look, because I know that you're worthy of God's love. And I want to call you into my family. I look and see at our staff and look and see at the people that call this church their home. That we come in here and we can show the world what you guys could truly do out there. If you can just accept that we are all worthy of God's love, that we can be standing next to each other, shoulder to shoulder, and worshiping our one God. What do you think about that? We have a unique opportunity, and now I'm talking about our church. What you just said, we have a unique opportunity at our church to go and show the world that we're doing it, that we're doing it here. That, that it doesn't matter where, what your background is, what color you're from, if you want to be mixed, if you want to be not mixed, you want to be black, you want to be white, you want to be young, you want to be old. We've never really talked about, like, that's what we're doing. Because it's not been, like, something on the eldership where we're just like, hey, guys, we're going to drive it this year. Our big initiative is to tell everybody that we're, you know, a mixed church. No, it's naturally just happened. It's naturally just happened where, where you've seen that people, man, who are a white family and they're adopting and bringing in two black children. And it's like, wow. And then you see in the church that you see the, the, the mixture, but it's all around the love of God. And we have a unique opportunity in this culture right now and in this climate to go and tell the world and to say, hey, maybe you should come and check, it out, check us out. It's, it's chaotic everywhere, but you should check it. You, can, you should come and check out the love that we have for each other at the church and what that means. I think we have an opportunity here. 
to really show them that Galatians 3.28 is really happening in our church. If you're not challenged by that, and, and all of this is really just like, I don't know what they're doing, it's weird, it's just, you know, if you're not challenged by that, man, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. That's the part that makes me afraid. We asked for questions. Uh, look at her. She's like, no, no. I don't think anybody wanted to ask any questions in the middle there of this. Was one. Oh, oh there was okay. One. It was, why are you guys sitting so close to each other? <laughs> really? really? That was the question? <laughs> we are kind of close to each other. Yeah. Hey, that's right. They set up the chairs by muscle mass, so it starts off really strong out there, and it gets weaker as you get over here. So, yeah, right. Yeah. You own a gym, holler at me, please. So, you know, in Austin Powers, where they're like the mini me, you know, I'm the mini me of Joe. <laughs> I'm sitting there. He's like, boo. I'm like, uh, small. Okay, here's the thing what we want to do with today. Um, first of all, we want you, if you have conversation that you want to have, if you want to, to, to vent, um, we're pastors up here. Um, we're part of wanting to hear from our church people. If you're young and you're like, I want to talk to one of our pastors about all of this that's happening culturally, I want to pray with one of them, um, just, we'll listen to you. That's one of the things we, we like to do. We just listen. We'll just listen to how you're feeling about things. We don't want to just pass through and just say, okay, we're going to move on and not talk about any of this because we're seeing it everywhere. So if you want to talk about it, you want to share, you want to um, start a conversation, um, if you're upset, if you have background that you're, it's so hard for you to get over, I know Joel, all of us, you know, when we're looking at it, um, we, there's backgrounds that we have that we've had to work through ourselves. That we've had to work through ourselves. All right, so we, we do have we one question. Yeah. All right, one question. Two, actually. Two. Okay, what do we do when we see racial action racist over, acts around us? Around racist, us. racist acts around us. I saw a picture yesterday someone shared with me of the of the black men who were all arm in arm protecting the white man behind them who was about to be um, uh, well, he was about to be attacked, about to be jumped, and they said, "Let's join arm in arm and protect this one behind us. Let's do that." How do we do that? You know, how do we do that as, as not only just the church, but how do we do that as people that they didn't, they, they just knew that they were doing the right thing. And I think that, man, when we talk about cues, the, the, the spirit doesn't need to give you a cue to do the right thing when you know what the word says. Isn't that true? Like, you don't need to think, uh-oh, is this my chance to, do I need to do something? No, the word's already told you. So don't step back. It takes bravery, though, right? Yeah, and I, and I think it applies, I mean, <clears throat> it applies really to any kind of, of injustice, you know. I mean, we're, we're talking about, about one specific one, but, I mean, any, any time that you see something unjust happen, or happening in front of you, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to, right now we live in this culture where, where we're more concerned about filming it and getting some viral video off of it and watching it happen than actually stepping in and doing something about it. And, and I think that, that uh, stepping in and, and saying something—it doesn't mean that you got to go crazy. It doesn't mean that you, that you've got to that you've got to act in the same the same manner that you're seeing um, things happen in. But um, action is what it takes. And, and a lot of times, yeah, it's it's nerve wracking. Um, we're not all confrontational people. I'm not a confrontational per person by nature. But there are certain things that I don't put up with. And when I see it happening, I address it. I say something, you can talk to my, my siblings. I have, I have literally taken um, people from tables and restaurants that I've seen just being mistreated, a uh, uh, girl being mistreated by some guys. And, and I went and I, I said something to them and I took her from their table, brought her over to our table, sat down, had a conversation, made her night better. Um, those are the kinds of things that you can do. And, and, and does it take some courage? Absolutely. Um, but. People that are doing those kinds of things are, are more likely to back down when other people start stepping in versus when you just want to pull out your phone and film it and, and not really actually do anything. So I think a lot of injustices happen when you see a crowd of people or people online and all they do is observe things. Yeah. It's one thing. You can sit there and observe all that. You can see cities on fire. You can see injustice. And you can just back and be an observer. 
It's the same way with the Word of God we talked about last week. When you see the Word of God and you're studying it, we need to observe, interpret, and then put it to application. If you're watching things in your workplace, in your schools, and all you're doing is observer and you're not speaking up about it, that's on you because God has called you to be in that moment to be a light in that dark situation. And you might get persecution from that, but what did you do in that moment? You stood up and you became an image bearer of Christ. Speaking into a dark situation, that might be hard. These conversations are not easy sometimes. When you have that friend that posts that stupid thing on Facebook, it's time to speak up about it. You know what I'm saying? It's time to actually read this and put it into application in your life. Because otherwise, all we're doing is observing and we're just commenting on the world. And comments do nothing. But when you apply the word of God in your life, you can truly bring change. You can start a conversation with someone that is truly a racist and you can lead them to the cross. But it doesn't happen if all you're doing is sitting back and observing. I agree. I, I copied this tweet from Tony Dungy. Uh, he's a, an ex-football coach in the NFL, but I, I think it really applies to this. Uh, he says, uh, well, what's the answer then? I'm just going further down. He says, I believe it has to start with those of us who claim to be Christians. We have to follow or we have to come to the forefront and demonstrate the, the qualities of the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. We cannot be silent. As Dr. King said many years ago, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And at the bottom, he uh, quoted Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What you're talking about by standing up, uh, it just brought a, a situation with with my boys, with Lincoln and Carver. One day Lincoln saw Carver getting picked on. If you know Carver, he's just one of the sweetest guys you'll ever know. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was it was unjust. It didn't need to happen. But Lincoln stepped up, hit the kid in the head with dodgeball. But <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about the action. But but he stood up. He saw that something that needed to be done. And I told him I was incredibly proud of him. And I believe that whenever we stand up for injustice, stuff that's that's. Like Mark was saying, you're there for a reason. You're seeing it for a reason. Dude, your Heavenly Father is just smiling. It's like, that's the courage. That's the lion that I created. And I feel like that's what we, have, we need to be like right now. Yeah. Um, what should our response be as Christians when it comes from an authority figure, somebody like a cop or um, just in a higher family? Let me answer that actually with a story from the Word. Okay, and what, what the question was, if you didn't hear it, was what should we do when we see injustice that's happening from an authority figure, as someone of authority, and we see it happening to someone that is lesser, I guess, than them, maybe. And one of the stories we know in scripture is when the woman is about to be stoned, yep. right? She's not perfect, I mean, she wasn't perfect. She had her past, sure, right? But she's about to be stoned by the authority figures, them being the Pharisees. And Jesus came and he steps in in that moment. Remember, stepped in. Who is this guy stepping in? Who are you to think that you could step in in the middle of what we're doing, right? And he steps in. She is about to be stoned. She's on her knees. You can just imagine how this is. She knows because if you did what she did, the result of that was that you should be killed. You should be killed. And Jesus steps in for her. And what does he say? He says, hey, if you have no issues or no sin in your life, if you have no background and no sin in your own life, then you be the one to be the throw the first stone at her. And what did all the bullies do? All the bullies dropped their stones and began to walk away because someone stood up for her. Right? And what happens in the story is that the lady in the story answers a question from Jesus I think is so important because I think when you stand up for someone who's, who's something in, unjust is happening to this person, regardless of the authority figures, something unjust is happening, that person says the name Lord. Because he, he says to her, who condemns you now? Who picks on you now? And he lifts her up, right? And her answer is so powerful. No one, Lord. Call him Lord. And I think when we do that, when we stand up, people see Jesus. People see the name of the Lord. But do we, will we do that, even though the authority figure may be above us? Something to think about. Yeah. 
Yeah. Any more, Jess? How do you speak to someone in love if they don't recognize their racist actions? <laughs> what if you take it? Right. I can take it. Yeah, I think um, for me personally, um, the, the worst thing that you can do is be accusatory to somebody, especially um, in a scenario like this, if they don't know. Um, because there's a lot of things that that are said, people's uh, levels of sensitivity to certain terms and certain things are different. Um, this is something that somebody might say to me is not gonna offend me, but it might offend the next person that they say it to. And so um, I know for me personally, um, I usually will say something about it. Now, now and I, looking at the intent, I think is the number one thing. So it doesn't even really matter what you say. If, if you said it with an intent to, um, or did it with the intent of being offensive, I'll take offense to it and I'll react that way. But if you just said it or did it and it wasn't, um, it was out of ignorance, then then it's, it's a simple like, oh hey, you know, some people wouldn't like that or I don't like that or, or, it, or, or if you're witnessing it and it doesn't apply to you specifically, you can say, hey, listen, that's probably not really appropriate to say that's offensive, but you should say it like this. And, and, it, and don't make such a huge deal out of it that the person gets defensive themselves. I mean, you, you want it to be um, just a, a natural, like, friend to friend, hey, just a heads up. Yeah, you're given an opportunity to raise their awareness. Yeah. And, and when you miss that opportunity, you're allowing them to go out and cause more bondage and pain for other people, right? So it's our job when we have that moment to observe. It's also our job to find an application time to actually help them raise their awareness. Like, hey, when you say that, that's like, that's racist, you know, just to put it out there plainly. And that's causing pain and hurting other people because they're thinking that you de are devaluing them. Do you want to do that? And, and I'm hoping that in this conversation, you're speaking to someone that's truth and love, though. You know, coming at them with rage and anger, that's not going to open up a line of communication. I don't know anyone that if you start screaming at them, they're just like, yeah, I want to listen to you. Go ahead and talk more. You know, it's, it's also in the attitude of, 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 your, of your communication as well. And Christ was really great about that as well. Yeah, and it's a question of whether or not we actually love the person or not. Yeah. Not the person who's even being, um, you know, spoken to in an unjust way. It's like the person who said it. Like, do you even love that person, and will you call them out? We said that a few weeks ago, that what is it? love is actually to actually be willing to call out somebody and to say, I'm loving you right now by saying, we can't say that. Your children are right there. You can't raise them that way. Come on, you can't say that in front of them. That's loving each other. Right. We, we had a situation with one of our, one of our students. They were, they were going on a trip with their friends, and it was they are going to go up to the lake, and the friend came back and said, hey, and, and one of our students, she was black, and the student that came back and said, hey, I can't really take you to the lake because uh, grandparents are racist and they're gonna, not really going to like you up there. And that was, that was the answer that this young girl had for her friend that was black. And that is a moment where that young girl could go to her grandfather and have a conversation. What do you have a problem with my friend that's black? Explain to me have this conversation. And that's a tough thing to do, but that's also something that we see constantly that people just are, you know, that's just who they are. Well, that person gets to answer for why they think what they think at some point. And sometimes it's a grandchild that comes up to them and say, explain to me, why do you hate this? Why do you think this? And they have to stand on ground and I guarantee you it's gonna be shaky ground. Because if they're a believer, they're walking on sand. A lot of it's ignorance, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's ignorance. It's not just like you're saying, I mean, a lot of it is ignorance. A lot of it for us is ignorance of Scripture. Like, we've ignored what scriptures have, Scripture has said, and we don't have a baseline for, for how we're living. Jess, yeah. any more? Uh, just one last thing we could do. Um, this is from a student, and they want to know if any of these events are leading to the rapture. Um, the truth is, we are in times yeah, church. You jumped in quick on that. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Rapture's coming. Jesus is coming back. Yeah. We don't know when, but it's going to happen. So, yes. <laughs> the answer to that is yes. Yeah. We don't know the day or time. No one does. Not even Jesus knew. 
to, to put it frankly, like the world gets worse, but the church gets brighter, and it's our response to be the light in the darkness. And as we go along, if you guys keep thinking like, oh, maybe next year will be better, and the year after that will be better, you just have to know that the world is, is led by and filled with evil. Yeah, the word says that the, the enemy is the prince of this world. Right. Like, some of us are shocked by that, like the prince of this world. So when we're seeing evil, we're seeing a lot of this happen in culture. If the enemy is the prince of this world, then we need to continue to see a lot of this. But how do we respond as God's people? The scripture even told us that he's coming back soon. Yeah. We don't know the time or the hour. But be ready. There's this meme that's out there of this lady. She's looking like this. Yeah. She's like, have you seen that? Yeah. She's like, oh, I'm just trying to see what part of Revelation we're in today. <laughs> yeah, and soon, and soon was a long time ago. Yeah, and yeah. soon was a long time yeah. ago. We are the soldiers yeah. of our commanding officer. Some of us, because we watch the news a lot, and some of us, because we, are, we get fired up by all of that, we've, some of us have lost our position. We've decided we want to move ahead of the commanding officer. And we want to post something. We want to get into a discussion with somebody. We want, to, we want to say something because we feel like we can command something. And we got to remember what the word says, is that we are the soldiers of Christ. And he's the commanding officer. And he's going to lead us. There's no good way to, and fast way to end one of these things. <laughs> no, so not. we've never really done something like this other than with prayer. All right. Other than with prayer, we ask for it right now that with everything that you have right now, that you would connect your spirit and your soul with the one we call Jesus Christ. And we're going to pray. OK. I have a question. Oh, we got a question right here, right out of before the prayer. Go ahead. She's asking, what do you think is the reason for this divide or, or, or what we're seeing right now? I, th I think, because um, I, I like to try to always see all sides of the, of the argument and, and, you know, I obviously nobody agrees with, with what happened uh, to, to Mr. Floyd, but um, then there's a lot of division when it comes to the response and, and what's right and what's wrong when it comes to people's anger. I think <clears throat> an important thing to note is that as believers, it's not wrong to be angry. The Bible doesn't say don't be angry. It says don't sin in your anger. Um, it talks about righteous anger. And so I think, but I think that the, that the divide is is there from people, like as I mentioned earlier, that that have, it's not just one experience. It's a bunch of experiences piled together. It's not just the one incident that just happened. There's three or four other highly publicized things that have happened just in the last month. And so when you get people that are all saying, okay, now we've got to band together as a, as a community and, and respond to this because the posts on social media aren't working. The protests are not working. The, the discussions that we're trying to have are not working, so now we're gonna take it up a level. And then they, they take things to the level that they're taking them, whether you agree with what they're doing or whether you don't, it, it doesn't really matter. But that, that's what causes the, the divide that you start to see, and it happens so fast, just, you know, it's like within just a few days, everybody kind of went from being on the same page, like this is horrible, we've gotta get some justice happening, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now they're doing this, and, and, and and so then you start seeing the, the things like, well, just remember, you know, we, you know, you guys do this stuff too, and, and then and then it becomes this weird, you know, finger pointing thing that that really has no relevance to what the real issue is. And I think that that that's where the problem it's the distractions. You know? Yeah, I think the thing to remember, the thing to remember is that God is not surprised by any of this, because if we actually believe what the word says, is that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. So you can, wherever you are, because of 
you know, your background or what you're watching or what you've inundated yourself with, not saying you specifically, but where what we're seeing, if you want to believe it's one thing or the other, the, 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 the whole point of it is, is that the enemy wants to disconnect and destroy. That's what he wants to do. And when we get lost in, he wants us to get lost in all the weeds of all of that. If we can get lost in all the weeds of the, of the, po the political side of it or the, the racial side of it, or you shouldn't do that to a building, you shouldn't do that to my target, you shouldn't do that to a cop, whatever it is, when we get lost in all of that, then we forget about what we just read in Galatians 3.28. That there is no longer slave nor free, or there is no longer Jew nor Gentile, there is no longer male or female, we are all one under God. And when we get lost in a lot of that, that's the enemy, what he wants to happen. That's what he wants to happen. And we can get fired up and we can post things because this is how we're feeling. I'm feeling this way, that it's a conspiracy. It's a, no, a lot of it just comes back to scripture. That this is what the enemy wants to do. And I, many of you can say he's just simplifying it. It sounds too simple and it sounds too trite for him to just say it like that. I can only go back to scripture of what it says that the enemy is trying to do when we see chaos like that. And I hope you young people can hear that and we can simplify it in a way where you could say that there is a Satan in this world who is called the prince of this world who doesn't want you to love God at all. He doesn't want you to love God. He wants you to be scared. And adults, we can get so smart and we can get so uh, philosophical that we forget that. And I think what we're seeing is a symptom of, a symptom, an outward sign of inward problem. I think we have a societal fracture where people have lost sight of truly what the word has given this world to, the greatest commandment given to us was to love our Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. And you have a fracture because people have lost what it means to love thy neighbor, to look at another person in a way that you would never want to put their life to an end because of a situation or because of the way they look. And we've lost that. And the only way that we can really answer that is now we have an application process where as believers, we need to be the effective change that we want to see. We need to love our neighbors in such a way that they would see us in a way that they want to be different, right? And I see that this is a societal fracture because you see just people hurting people because of the way they look, because they've been told that, that goes against everything that I know about the word of God. So, yeah. I have another question. Um, you know, a tangible thing that we can do. I feel like Christians have become so loose um, doing what we know is right. And I, I would bet good money that not many churches are doing what they're doing. Not talking about it. They're throwing shit around. And that's fine. But there's not a need in the space that it's happening. It, it, it is. What can we do to step up and, and be the light on the hill? Be the example. So the question is, what is the tangible things? What is the things that we can really do outside of? Prayer starts with prayer, right? What is the tangible things that we can do? I was just thinking as you were talking. In just a moment, many of you are going to probably eat. You're going to go somewhere and eat, wherever. You're going to be in a public place. And there's going to be someone who doesn't look like you, somebody who doesn't, um, maybe not in the, so the same socioeconomic status as you. They're going to be right near you, really close. And the spirit of the living God is going to give you a cue. And you can say, how are you going to do? Are you going to open the door for this person? Are you going to be hyper? It's time for us to be hypersensitive to the spirit of the Lord. And what I mean by that is that when you open the door and some, this, this person who's white coming through and you are black, are you going to greet this person in the culture we're in with such a smile that they know that you have the spirit of the living God within you? That you, they will see the face of Jesus in you. Because you have done something, you've looked at them. And I thought many of you have, you've felt this, right? Where you've been in a place and you know that that person is the, that knows the Lord. Like you know it because the way that they're smiling at you, the way that they're talking, there's something over them. And we're going to have an opportunity. 
We're going to have an opportunity to do this. And don't fail. Don't fail. Don't, don't just regress back to what you've known growing up. Don't regress back to your fears. Don't come back to just not doing anything. What did he say, man? If you are complacent and you don't do anything, then you've accepted what we're living in. That can't be us. We've got to do something. And it's going to start today. I promise you, there's going to be an opportunity. And if you don't see it and you miss it, if you don't miss that, man, the, the Spirit will, I, I promise you, the Spirit will remind you later. You might stub your toe. I don't know. Something. <laughs> where you'll be, you'll be like, man, I, I, you had the opportunity right there to do something. Yeah, and I think just not being, not, not staying silent is, is the big thing, you know. It doesn't necessarily, if you're not, doesn't necessarily mean I, I think that everyone needs to go out here and post something on social media. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I have not posted anything on social media, but I think it, it's in the conversations that you have with people. It's when it's being talked about around you that you're not going to sit there and just stay quiet and just think like, well, if I don't say anything, then I, I, I just don't need to get involved. You know, it, it's, it's getting involved and giving a, a Christian perspective into the situation, you know. We want to keep the conversation going. Um, if you have questions or thoughts, you're watching this online today, if we're still online, if you're watching this online, send in your questions, send in your thoughts. We, like I said, keep the conversation going. The last thing I want to say is for the young people in here today, the young people who sat through this whole thing that the adults are doing. Young people, change our world. Change our world. Father God, you are the God we see in Scripture still. You have not changed. You have been there from the beginning, creating mankind, Father, as your creation. We thank you that because we are creation, God, that you are a God who's given us John 3, 16, because for God, you love the world, that you gave your son so that the world would not perish, the world would not burn, the world, world would not be caught on fire but that the world would be able to come to you through Jesus Christ. That you did not want to condemn the world at all, but that you sent your son so that we could have connection with you. The stories of scripture, the writings of scripture, Father, the passages we've even read today have been examples of Jesus wanting to bring his people together. Father, I pray and, and, and pray that we'll have action as we leave here today. That, Father, we will be the church I thank you for this church that has said that has said I love you to people that somebody that doesn't look like you that has said I want to sit with you at lunch you don't look like me I want to I want to be right here next to you I want to give you a hug even though you don't weren't raised in the same place as me I want to become an elder of a church although they're different colors and different backgrounds than I ever had that I never even saw in the town I was growing up because I love people because God loves people Father, I pray that you would heal our country today. We ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people say, amen. amen. You guys have a good day, all right? Keep the conversations going.